a salt marsh. And um, it's, uh, it's always funny to say when their friends get in my car, it's like, oh, it's just mom's boots in the back because she's been in a marsh today. Um, so thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, I, I haven't been able to get to any of these meetings. I really appreciate being able to come and speak to you tonight. And I have the daunting task of trying to summarize impacts we're seeing today in marshes. And I um, don't have my colleague Marcy Cole with me, but she's my partner in uh, the Salt Marsh, as well as Kenny Raposa from the Estuarine Research Reserve out on Prudence. Um, some of the data that I'm go going to show tonight is from Kenny. And so Jim asked me to highlight a little bit about historic impacts. You've heard this fact before. We've lost over 50% of our marshes from historic activities. And I think showing Cav Pasture Point and Allen Harbor and um, not only the marsh filling, but also the uh, coastal, um, actually, filling of Narragansett Bay, it's a pretty dramatic picture. And it, it illustrates how much of our salt marshes historically were filled, um, about 4,000 acres. Back in the mid-90s, um, Save the Bay, in partnership with volunteers from around the state and land trusts, municipalities, we assessed salt marshes looking for additional impacts from um, man-made activities, human activities, such as tidal restrictions, additional filling, ditching, stormwater runoff. And we identified many restoration opportunities. And over the past almost two decades, um, Save the Bay, and multiple partners, um, Army Corps of Engineers, CRMC, DEM, municipalities, um, have been working on many of those restoration sites. We had the opportunity to do some pretty intensive monitoring at these restoration sites. This is Gooseneck Cove and Newport. And um, this was some of the pre-restoration monitoring that we were doing. and we. We're able to see how quickly a marsh can res um, respond to subside. In this case, it's subsidence. This was, is a tidally restricted marsh. Um, Ocean Drive is at the mouth of um, Gooseneck Cove. There was an old dam um, that was just downstream of this site, and it impounded water on the marsh. And over the last 100 years since these restrictions have been in place, the marsh has sank. We happened to, my colleague Marcy happened to set up a sediment elevation table um, in 2004 um, with help from USGS in the marsh when it was still somewhat vegetated. In the late 90s, I had a group of um, students out on this marsh. Six years later, we've lost, um, the marsh surface has subsided between four and se seven centimeters and we've lost all of the vegetation. So that's, that it can happen that quickly, and it doesn't take it just four centimeters, and you have standing water, and basically no vegetation. Um, so what we realized back about, as, as Grover was saying, these impacts we've been seeing um, relatively frequently. About five or six years ago, we started noticing kind of um, looking around beyond the restoration sites that we were so intimately involved in, we started seeing these similar degraded conditions at other marshes around the state. A lot of this um, dead um, shallow pond or dead zones and shallow um, ponded water areas. And the, the hypothesis for why this is occurring is this chart that you've probably seen multiple times in these meetings and others. Um, showing the, the sea level rise rate. And I'm not going to get into significant <coughs> detail here other than to say marshes historically have been able to keep up, um, build their elevation or accrete and keep up with sea level rise. Um, with Even back in the 80s, Scott Nixon and another researcher from URI um, found that marshes were accreting and building up and keeping up with that about 2.6 to 2.7 millimeters per year. Just recently, Joanna Carey, who was working um, out at the research reserve and at the EPA lab, was involved in a, going back to those same sites and finding that those same marshes are not keeping up with sea level rise due to the increased rate of sea level. Um, 
Additionally, we've been seeing uh, over the last five years, we're in a cycle where the tides are running higher more frequently, so there's more inundation of the marsh surface more regularly. Just yesterday I was out at a marsh and the person I was with said the tide was much higher than he expected. I looked online, you can go to NOAA's website and go and observe, you can go to the, the day of or go back and see historic data. But the tide ran about a foot higher than predicted uh, yesterday. And we're seeing that mo much more frequently. And Jim asked me to put this slide in. And again, others here can speak um, more articulately about this graph. But this is, as I understand it, Jim, is the historic rate of sea level rise. Um, so you just saw that our marshes aren't keeping up with this historic rate. And then you add the various projections. The USAC is U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or NOAA, the, the various rates. Even if you're looking at the um, low NOAA and Army Corps rates, our marshes are not keeping up with the projected sea level rise in the future. Um, so it, what is before us is, that's why we're talking about marsh migration. These marshes are going to be um, moving inland, drowning in place, and unfortunately, um, the, the, the future of our marshes is, is not rosy, to say the least. Um, but I think it is interesting to see I, that we are, our marshes today, even at the, the slower um, historic rate, are, are not doing well. So about three years ago, we, um, my colleague convened some, um, a bunch of different restoration practitioners, and with funding from CRMC and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we began a, an assessment um, looking at a bunch of different assessments from um, Massachusetts, um, the mid-Atlantic region, and we were trying to come up with a, a somewhat simple, somewhat rapid methodology to um, assess, per, quantify these conditions that we are observing and monitor changes from that point in time, monitor changes over time, as well as trying to identify potential adaptive management. Penetrometer, which is this little device here we endearingly called Penny because she weighs a lot, um, was fun to carry Penny in the marsh, especially in a site like this um, where you're, you're um, footing wasn't that solid. And we took the bearing capacity measurements at different um, zones in the marsh. Also looked at salinity and mosquito, um, if there was mosquito larvae present uh, and, and uh, fish species present in these shallow pools. Um, and just quickly, because I'm going to refer to different zones, um, I think the slide that Jim, Jim showed of round marsh in Jamestown, the one with the two, uh, the seaside sparrow and the salt marsh sparrow, there was a significant amount of high marsh in that photograph. That's this zone. And um, the, the key thing here to note is this, the high marsh that has uh, some pools, deeper pools, and some of these pans or um, shallow depressions that are usually vegetated floods occasionally during the month. And that's just something to keep in mind. Um, also note, usually there's some type of um, Spartina altiniflora growing at different heights that grows along um, the edge of the marsh and it can flood daily. Uh, so I'll go back to this um, image a little later. This is what we're observing in many marshes around the region. We're observing these uh, shallow ponded water areas. Um, uh, Caitlin from CRMC has, um, I like her term, calls it pool creep. So here we have the defined pool, again, historically found in marshes, deep enough to support fish um, that feed on, uh, this is a ball of mosquito larvae. Um, in a pool like the bottom left, you're not going to see the mosquito larvae. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were back at the same pool on the Narrow River. There were significant numbers of great egrets feeding on in that little pool area. All the surrounding water that's only a couple inches deep doesn't support, um, it doesn't have the conditions to support fish. They're, it's too warm, it's too shallow, it's too um, salty, especially in the summer months. Um, ideal mosquito breeding habitat 
you know, no birds feeding in, in those um, shallow pools in the background. Um, so this is just something to, to keep in mind when, you're, when we're looking back at um, kind of your historic zonation. Um, this other things that we found, very narrow, uh, narrow sections of high marsh. The high marsh was found um, more at the outer edge on the cove side or the um, estuary side or at the upland edge. We also noticed um, expanded barren areas. If you dig down in this peat, you'll find, not, not even too deep, you'll find the roots of Spartina, Peyton, some of the high marsh grasses. Um, we also found a lot of degraded Spartina altiniflora, which again is the low marsh grass that can get flooded a couple times a day. It can grow in standing waters for short periods of time, but if the water sits on the marsh surface like you see here, um, it begins to get quite stunted. In some places, it almost looks like someone's been out mowing the marsh. It's, it's so stunted. As, as the marsh, um, the vegetation degrades in the marsh, that is when the, the marsh is no longer able to keep up with sea level rise. The way our marshes in Narragansett Bay and throughout New England, how they build elevation or accrete is either via sediment deposition or through organic matter. And in New England, it's mainly the buildup of organic matter. So without vegetation, without a healthy um, marsh community, you're not going to, that, that organic matter, is, it's not going to bind the soil where it's, that vegetation um, is, is gone and the, the root material actually begins to degrade and you start seeing a degradation of the peat and that a, slow, a slow decrease in the ability of that, that marsh to keep up with sea level rise. Um, so that's just a little bit about um, the conditions we found. Our survey wasn't as much to focus on um, the outer edge of the marshes, but as, as Grover mentioned, um, it's pretty dramatic to see how quickly the marsh edge is eroding. Um, there are a lot of hypotheses out there this is Stillhouse Cove, a lot of geese predation, um, herbivory possibly from marsh crabs, fiddler crabs, Sasarma is another species of um, marsh crab, um, and a large kind of calving. Of, this is on the Narrow River. There's boat traffic as well, but there's a lot of impacts to the edges of the marsh, not only the marsh flooding more, but the edges eroding. Um, Beth Watson from the EPA lab just across the street uh, has done an analysis looking at loss of marsh. And from just the 1970s, this is back, going back to 1939, but from the 1970s, she's estimating about a 12.5% loss of vegetation coverage in our marshes. And this is a site I've been in, familiar with over the years and seen, witnessed this change. Um, just take a look at that old ditch in 1939 to 2012. And this is what it looks like on the ground. The marsh is disappearing before our, our eyes. As well, you see a, this large impounded water area forming. Um, it, you don't have to go back to the, the 30s or the 70s. You can see this if you use the Google Earth tool, which um, allows you to go back to usually aerial imagery going to the early 90s or mid-90s. This is 1995. This is Mary's Creek in Warwick. Same situation. You can see the um, ero marsh erosion on the edge and the creek expansion occurring. Um, the high marsh is found in these narrow bands, and the shallow ponded where water is expanding across this kind of marsh plain here where the high marsh had been found. I mentioned Kenny Raposa out at Prudence. He's been monitoring since 2000 Coggeshell Marsh, and he's found um, that the similar condition where the Spartina altiniflora, the low marsh grasses are expanding, while Spartina patens, the high marsh grasses, are um, decreasing. And from his predictions, from looking at this um, graph, he's seen the, the rap, it's a rapid decline. It's over like, 50, I believe, 59% decline of Spartina patents since when he began um, the, uh, I believe he has data going back a little further from the late 1990s. 
sites in the Taunton River, we're seeing some of the degradation along the leading edge of the marsh, unfortunately. So just quickly, Kevin and all the others are going to be, and Caitlin and Jim are going to talk about marsh migration. This is the narrow. Marshes are migrating currently. Um, this is a Tupelo forest here, and um, there's some maples. And you have some of the high marsh grasses and uh, seaside goldenrod migrating underneath the forested canopy. Um, and that's kind of what this little schematic shows. The challenge is, is when you have some type of structure or just an elevation change, a natural elevation change, which prevents that migration. Many sites where we were doing the monitoring, we had a hard time finding that upland edge of the marsh because it kept going inland. It kept um, going beyond um, where the, the Phragmites was. We would keep finding more and more marsh vegetation further inland. And we're seeing some of these same degraded conditions in the areas where the marsh is migrating. This is Winnipeg. Um, here's the marsh out, out here. This is a little um, area of sand. It's an overwash um, from probably, Ryan's maybe the 1939. I'm not exactly sure. I had, didn't go back to look at the historic imagery. But there's a little marsh area that's forming here. And we're finding those same degraded conditions, water's getting impounded in those areas. And these tiny little impoundments, this is a little deer trail going through here, were um, inundated with mosquito larvae. So just because the marsh has a place to migrate inland, it doesn't mean it's a healthy uh, marsh. And in this case, again, where do you end your transect? Um, because the marsh, that's the edge of the Phragmites, this is the high marsh actually being mowed, and then you have um, the marsh edge, the upper marsh also being mowed. The, the marsh is migrating, in this case, into this person's yard. And Caitlin's going to mention adaptive management. I just wanted to highlight one of the goals of the salt marsh assessment was to identify places where we could do something to improve the health of these marshes today. And it is a daunting topic. Um, as Grover mentioned, we're losing these marshes, but they, are, they still provide habitat value today. They still create mosquito breeding habitat today. So we need to do things to help them adapt and possibly make them more resilient. Um, these guys down here. And knowing that what my grandmother taught me about salt marshes, it's not necessarily going to be what I'm going to be able to pass down to my children or Caitlin's son here, um, the, that we are losing this collective heritage. And what can we all do to try to um, improve upon um, the, the health of these marshes wherever they migrate to in the future? And I would be remiss not to thank the many, many people who came out and helped us with the salt marsh assessment. And there's always opportunity to continue to do this assessment as we go back to some of these sites. So if you ever want to get out and check out um, what, how we uh, monitor some of the adaptive management, we'd love to have more volunteers. And I see many familiar faces today here. So thank you. Sorry if I ran over. Okay, while we're getting set up for the next speaker, we can take one or two questions, Wendley, just okay. to clarify, and then we'll, when the next speaker's queued up, we'll move on. Any questions for Wendley? 